Those of us who ventured there dream of red brick wards and chipping plaster hallways, fenced in windows, security cages around stairwells, dripping soggy basement morgue of the old asylum. A place where you can see your breath even on the hottest summer day. Once there was a plantation here, a whole town called Overbrook, but the local normal folks called it the bin, as in loony bin. Sick minds, incautious thoughts, nauseous thinking took place here. Things you will never think, ever, were thought here on a daily basis by the shuffling, sad hordes of gray-eyed saints impossibly lucid in their madness, shuffling in slippers down corridors where once there were no puddles or piles of trash, corridors that led to cafeterias that weren't yawning in silent screams towards the sanitarium sky. Once, the old asylum was the new asylum. People from my generation forget about that. These arched plaster wards weren't always so wretched. They didn't always fall. Once they were put up by workers in coveralls, wearing ties on their shirts and old pork pie hats with cigars in old 1800s dress, big mechanical industrial style, iron steam pipes, medieval gynecological chairs, people shut up on hot wards before the days of air conditioning when coal was consumed and came by train car during harsh winters to heat the massive insane asylum. Always an uncomfortable temperature in all seasons. Situated above the Peckman River, the brook that overbrook is over, that drains Second Mountain into the Passaic River whose flow I have followed all of my life, from the top of the mountain to Newark Bay and beyond in boats. For me, Overbrook was magical and the source of all creativity, but to the patients it could be hell. The government's best shot at keeping shell-shocked veterans, alcoholics, schizophrenics, drug addicts, and just general nuts off the streets. A better alternative than the highway underpass. An offering of asylum to the poor, confused and weak. Also a cage for the violently insane and a laboratory for the study of human madness. Their best shot? Yes. But now outdated. Let them live under bridges. Lock them in jail. No one cares to see it. Mental illness just as stigmatized and shunned as in the 1800s when Overbrook was founded, only worse, now even less compassionate. Lock them up, they're criminals, call the thought police. And also the heartless greed for land, purposeful neglect of Overbrook buildings to free up valuable real estate, the untapped old asylum market. There's lots of land here basically all that's left. Overbrook was once a plantation, men farming fields, milking cows, a town unto itself, producing its own food and free labor, women darning socks, repairing knee holes in the female front hill day room, keeping busy, now they call it slave labor, unpaid workers are not union friendly, so the farm died. The greenhouse collapsed. The women had no darning or knee hole repair to accomplish, so they sat on hot wards, sweated and stank, did nothing and accomplished nothing except to get bored, restless, crazier. And there were too many patients to keep track of, especially with the revolving door. No one wanted to work there in later years when all the really qualified doctors and nurses moved on past crumbling bricks and leaky slate roofs to New York, Atlanta, or California 
to practice their principles in modern accommodations, places where the hospital still smelled clean, unlike the rotting asylum stench that would permeate clothes and hair, with a nursing home cafeteria odor, reminiscent of stale medicine, bad plumbing, careless hospital waste, now strewn across floors and tabletops in the abandoned version of Overbrook. Still stinking, but now rubs off on workers' clothes who are abating and tearing down the bin. No longer an asylum, but a construction site. The workers go home stinking of ghosts and old medicine no longer practiced wearing respirators, but still breathing in the madness that lingers here, and spreading to their wives and kids around the dinner table after work, the mind sickness. Patients sat here for lifetimes, breathing in the stench and contributing to it with body functions and sick mental functions. Insanity is still in the air. They keep guards against trespassers so it won't spread. But we, who have ventured through long wards and soggy tunnels of Overbrook Asylum, are tainted as well. We will never be the same or look at history in the light. We will see only the cavernous arched corridors lined with darkness and isolation cells. We will see and smell the wards in our dreams, the stagnant day rooms of summer, the frozen puddles and sinks and on floor of Overbrook winter, not with anguish like the patients, but with a love for the abandoned, a yearning to escape suburban confinement without going too far from home, a wild free place, forbidden yet inviting, the old asylum on the mountain that called to generations of kids looking for a thrill where patients once suffered Teenagers now laugh, take selfies, fill the wards with vape clouds, and spray paint fumes. We are tainted, yes, but in a good way. Changed by Overbrook from a lifetime of driving down Fairview Ave and cutting through Verona to get from Caldwell to Montclair without too much Bloomfield Avenue. Almost forgotten are the farm and enchanted woods the shuffling patients smoking on the lawn in their gowns as we passed and waved as kids in our carpool station wagon. Almost forgotten, the mood the asylum would conjure in our young, scared minds. Something to keep you up at night with real fears of escaped psychopaths and unquiet ghosts. A real haunted place, not too far away, but now forever gone. Overbrook was a public institution and remained so even after it was abandoned, when flocks of adventure seekers illicitly descended on the old asylum and became familiar with ancient corridors now theirs, as it had once belonged to others before them, those patients who ruled the wards in a different way, who bullied and strong-armed other patients dominant inmates who intimidated nurses, guards, and doctors, arrogant, sick men who thought themselves kings of Overbrook, but who are now dead and gone, like other kings of other things that have passed from this earth. And from the new breed of trespassing kids, there were definitely a few standouts who had a little more tact and sensibility than their mostly pompous peers 
who through no fault of their own had never experienced the white bricks of the Essex Mountain Sanatorium because they came of age just as Overbrook was lapsing into full abandonment. But guys like me, who had been infiltrating the asylum for many years before it was even closed, did not necessarily welcome the new clique, who very seriously declared themselves to be urban explorers and claimed to own Overbrook, despite having just arrived at the very end of Overbrook's timeline. But no matter how territorial us old-timers might have been, the Urbex generation had their place on the vacant wards of the Essex County Hospital Center. Some truly amazing photography, videos, and written material has emerged from the abandoned sanitarium, proving that the old asylum is still a public institution, and that there is no one king or queen of only brothers and sisters who still believe in breaking rules and taking risks just for the fun of them. Not even the big county honchos rule Overbrook. Maybe they could have, but they traded their kingdom for condos and knocked the asylum down. I understand the urge to mark territory on the wards of Overbrook. There are many factions who aim to do so. The funniest claims are the kids who are just now old enough to discover the abandoned hospital as they are finally tearing it down. All they know is the abated hulk and have no perspective on the patients who lived and died here or the true state of abandonment when the hospital was closing with all medical equipment left in place but now cleaned up and all the ghosts temporarily hiding from construction crews and demolition machines that won't stir again until condos are built and settled by innocent, unwary tenants who will suddenly rediscover spirits when kitchen knives keep levitating off the counter and the chairs in the living room start rearranging themselves. The new kids of the Urbex generation never saw the patients walking here never witness the ghosts. They come from other towns and states, even fly in from Europe and abroad to photograph Overbrook. And we of the old guard, who remember everything and know the hospital history because it's a part of our own history, can't blame them for being attracted to the old asylum because it really is a mind-blowing institution. When Chuck Palahniuk's choke was filmed here, we rejoiced and felt vindicated for our love of the crumbling asylum. When Corrado Soprano ended up in an overbroke day room and Tony came to visit, we nearly leapt out of our seats with joy that a show so amazingly awesome would glorify our asylum and perfectly capture the spooky mood of the hospital in the series finale. And yeah, we weren't so happy about the Ghost Hunters episode because it was incredibly lame and actually tarnished the legacy of real ghosts with their fake reality TV nonsense. But still, who can blame them for wanting to film here? If any place on earth is haunted, it's gotta be Overbrook. 10,000 people died here between those red brick walls in this public institution that remains a public institution, even though it is closed and off limits and being demolished. So remember, kids, and old timers alike, no matter how many times you've walked those halls, no matter how intimate you are with the tunnel system, no matter what you think you know about the Essex County Hospital Center, you cannot claim territory in the old asylum. You do not have more or less clout than the patients, the police, or the trespassers who came before you. There is no king of Overbrook. We are the public. Overbrook is ours.
freezing overbrook sunrise, fresh snow crunching under boots, roaring red reflections in the glass of every unbroken window, capped in white bricks and snow to accent red bricks and bright red glare under fancy copper gutters, elaborate leaders and a frozen copper cupola morning raven croaking at the dawn like a haunted rooster, not complaining of the cold, but reveling in it, just like me, every step breaking clean snow, the only prints from herds of deer in fresh powder over deep drifts in grazing lines of the field, past the gazebo, walking through tall dead grass, morning fog still swirling, soon to be burnt off by the sun, but not just yet. Everything above the mist is sharp with long morning rays, and the windows catch and hold beams of color, lit up so bright it looks like fire, but with no smoke. A grinning jack-o'-lantern, out of season, but perfectly placed to inspire Halloween feelings all year round. Normally, this would be a bad place to walk, up the fields and on the roads just outside the backside of the hospital. Not so dangerous today, though. The roads up here haven't been plowed all this year, so the cops can't drive up so easily to bother with people like me, who are now inside the decaying asylum, where it's even colder than outside and breath billows in basement of reception, staring at the four-drawer morgue, spray-painted stainless steel drawers of the cooler, with racks for body storage, these dirty trays of death, so solid. The morgue drawers have been vandalized, but in general, the apparatus is still intact and hasn't been collected for scrap metal or dismantled for souvenirs. It's dirty here. The sense of death and mortality is strong. Also, it smells pretty bad, even on this frozen morning. Further down the hall, the science laboratory with its massive autoclave and huge submarine hatch style wheel for big sterilization jobs that are no longer performed. Bags and bags of biohazard medical waste left to rot on floors, tables, gurneys, moldering medihazard covering every available surface, and entire libraries of patient records spilling out of ancient filing cabinets, stories of phobias, venereal disease, mind sickness, agony, grief. Vandals have strewn them across the floor for my reading pleasure, but not today suddenly craving sunshine, take the stairs leading up out of the low basement, piles of pigeon dung on landing under broken window, frozen enough to not get stuck between waffle tread boots, going up, up, up to the roof of reception, standing at the edge five stories high, looking out on snowy world below, the sun now peeling back mist over Verona, Cedar Grove, Montclair, Claridge House landmarks on the next mountain to the east, now visible, cold and clear, fog almost gone, three turkey buzzards soaring overhead, riding high airwaves, looking for moist red spots in all this white, and Overbrook is a tremendous red splotch dead carrion leftovers of an obsolete institution, but their view is white-capped roofs of snow, punctuated by gaping holes where dormers or copper cupolas were stripped for scrap, and dripping water, rotted wood underneath, collapsing into gaping holes and contrasting sharply black with snow around. Down below, a herd of deer paw at the drifts for buried greens, smoke emanating from quadruped nostrils and billowing clouds. Lovely, vegetable.
vegetary beasts living off the land. Down there in the sanitarium field, lone buck standing apart from females, munching and staring into the woods. And it feels good to be up here, dressed warm in toasty gloves, two insulating layers under pants, sweatshirt under heavy jacket, not rushed or pestered by the cold, no need to seek warmth inside, not that inside would be any warmer anyway, here in Overbrook, where it is colder indoors than out, except in steamy summer, when the heat builds up, and the mental war comes to a boil, this asylum always struggled with temperature control, funny how some things never change, but no matter what the season, Overbrook smells bad, like mold, soggy plaster, disinfectant, medical waste, death. But wait, things are changing here. This will be Overbrook's last winter. Where these wards stand next year will be new condominiums in the final stages of completion. Lighting this property in rows and clusters, growing on old asylum land like fungus on a corpse the creeping spores of modern overpopulation, land lust, and greed. But the smell of Overbrook, that rank, infected, fly-blown hospital stench, is so supernaturally strong and persistent that it will surely infect the new condos, which will reek from the foundations up of sick mental patient ghosts standing in line outside master bedrooms looking for nightly medication from sleeping tenants who had no idea this space on the second floor of their new home was the nurse's station of the back mail hill. And oh, what a day at the Overbrook Asylum. Walked the entire hospital and didn't encounter a single living soul. Overbrook is such a tourist trap these days. It's nice to get some alone time. That's why I visit during rainstorms or after heavy snowfall, early in the morning, or in the dead of night. It's also good during cataclysmic world events when everyone is distracted by TV and emergencies, while I haunt the old asylum, alone, still in shadows, sometimes sitting in day room chairs, taking in the mood of the abandoned asylum, everything covered in muck and plaster sludge growing moss, now brown and icy with cold, spray-painted vulgarities on walls, ceiling, and floor, the old layers of paint beneath new spray paint, peeling off in fish food flakes, covering rotting linoleum tiles, and destroying good graffiti, in this case, a huge demon face that utilizes holes in the wall for eyes, but now the plaster is chipping, and the demon is left with half a face. Fun stuff like this. The asylum is a museum of still lifes that will give you a shudder even in the summer. The very essence of spooky horror. The main line of rotting decay. No ordinary vacant abode, but a full-fledged, haunted, abandoned mental institution. Essex County Hospital Center, Overbrook. Spent two-thirds of my life won't last much longer, but I will always have this Overbrook day, now with frozen fingers and ink-stained hand from scribbling in notebook about winter wards and sanitarium impressions, collecting words from Overbrook before the old asylum falls.
up, down, sideways, crazy bricks, infected with madness, saturated with sorrow, loony bin bricks, red with brain blood, bleeding clots of deranged minds, globs like horror flicks, but this is real, not some fake thing, truly dangerous, this rotting hulk, in the cold winter rain, when the water pours in, where copper sheathing was stolen by junkies at night with ladders, who climb in the dark with owls to catch copper and disturb bats. The rain pours in, a ghost keeps moving down long asylum hallways, hellish corridors, and the gurney is still here, getting dripped on now, rusting at the joints, a hulk itself in the corroded shell of the monolithic red brick hospital. A woman screamed here a hundred years ago, bled on the straps, cursed God here, stainless tubes on wheels, once built at a factory, now askew, covered in wet plaster dust. Eighty-something years ago, a man screamed and wet himself on this gurney. Insulin shock therapy, they called it. The homeowners around the hospital, those people in the neighborhood, could hear the screams from the old asylum on hot summer nights when windows were open and curtains blew in warm gusts after dinner and the picnic table was covered in paper plates. The screaming would start, killing the jovial buzz. What a party stopper, that screaming. Because in Overbrook Asylum, the wards were hot, the patients were sweaty and horny and confined. Insulin shock therapy. Better than saltpeter, one nurse was heard to exclaim. Of course, that was a different era, infancy of modern mental health care. Red bricks, climbing with ivy, patients in thin robes and sometimes street clothes, wearing slippers, with shaky hands, smoking pack after pack of cigarettes. Even their brains are sometimes shaking and twitching and rattling. Red bricks, once with windows intact, not broken, not shattered by vandals and generations of trespassing teenagers. Windows with no wounds, with people staring out, watching for the world, hoping to be well someday, secretly knowing that could never be. Empty windows now, empty of faces and sometimes of glass, not a sanitarium anymore, not a hospital, no asylum here. Spray paint scar, trashed, burnt, decayed, abandoned. Wake up early, winter rain, black boots, military pants, hooded sweatshirt, morning coffee, standing in the foggy woods. Up near the building now, inside through a window, cold, deep blackness, sanitarium cellar, patrol car just outside, slow, quiet creeping, undetected infiltration. Up on the third floor, a noise is heard. Peering around a corner, three SWAT men, armed officers of the law, Kevlar helmets and silenced radios, gun on hips, taser and ammo belts. Head of mine whips back around corner, unseen. Policy of ghostliness pays off. Slip quietly away from police. Stormtroopers and modern bulletproof shells standing in a hundred-year-old hallway, protecting the abandoned mental hospital, waiting to bust anyone, everyone, who would creep and sneak here among the drips and plaster puddles. 
Once they kept us locked away on this ward, now they try to keep us out, threatened with handcuffs and fines. Defiant trespass, they call it. But to be a ghost, like the other ghosts here, is the best plan. Ghosts wander alone, never in groups. Who ever heard of a group of ghosts? Ghosts don't need to be seen or heard, don't need to be smelled or detected in any way. They blow around our heads undetected. Be like a ghost in Overbrook Asylum, and you will fit in nicely. No one will bother your silent haunting if you hover down corridors or creep slowly upstairs. Invisibility is your ghostly reward. There are spirits here, personalities and quirks of dead patients who once shuffled the wards, but now hover and glide invisibly, except for cold spots suddenly felt when one passes near or through your still corporeal body. The cops don't feel them, too much armor, but it's not the Kevlar, it's their training, a lifetime of standing in line, now enforcing the lines, waiting in ambush for transgressors, inhabiting the asylum, but not ghosts themselves like we are. Cops loiter, but do not haunt, commanded to trap and capture illegal trespassers who might break into the massive insane asylum, who might light fires and spill beer on the floor, who will smash windows and spray paint obscene words, satanic graffiti with too many sixes and upside down stars. The neighbors don't like that, so the cops wait like spiders in their trapdoor hole, in this case at the intersection of five hallways, which used to be the main hub of the hospital. Caged in stairs, nurse's desk, instruction map that says, you are here. Three cops wait, but do not see the trespassing ghost, undetected. So slip back downstairs and dart, positively dart into the tunnels under admin. Cave-like hallway with pipes, and soon to be remediated asbestos insulation under Fairview Ave. The tunnel ends, cinder blocks where once the nurse's home stood. Not even a pile of rubble, just a blank field, soon to be a tiny park that will serve as a smoke screen for the condominiums they will build here when the asylum is torn. They will claim preservation, talk of open space achieved, promises kept while they rip out history and build flimsy housing for overpopulated people. And where will the deer, turkey, owls, grouse, coyote, fox, skunk, and bats go off to? Where will they live? Will they even exist anymore? Like the asylum won't exist? Are we tearing down the animals too? More patrols outside. But Overbrook will protect her ghosts, and the ghosts will stay here. They have no other place to go anyway. Just like the animals, a ghost can't escape. The security fence will go up. The construction equipment will move in. The loony bin walls will fall. Wards will crumble and collapse. Condos will rise in their place. But the ghosts will remain. The slippered, vacant-eyed granny died here. The rapist, murderer, criminally insane monster who aged and died here. The alcoholic who hung himself in the attic. The nurse tragically attacked and killed in the basement. The patients who froze in their cells one winter when the boilers broke. The thousands of elderly who withered away, dull-eyed and confused, not insane, just old, scared, and alone. All the thousands who died here will remain. These ghosts, asylum-dwelling spirits, landlocked hostages, roaming decaying hallways, searching for the truth of their death, 
wondering disjointedly at the machines and the equipment and the workers in spacesuits cutting out asbestos, red bricks falling, crumbling, losing their pattern, the pattern that held them, comforted them, failing finally only with the greatest effort of the Kumatsu, resisting gravity in solid hunks, but falling anyway, eventually. The ghosts will wander here. They will infest your condominiums and distractionary park. They will breeze through your new community center, curse your children and stunt their growth. Your people will now live among the insane dead and the ghost of the asylum herself, a savage demon who will not let go of the mountain. The foundations of the condominiums are born in a grave built on contaminated land. All who live in the new homes will be jinxed. Haven't these people ever seen the movie Poltergeist? It could have been open space and the ghosts would have been free and benign and happy. But now the condominiums might as well be mausoleums. The street signs on the new roads might as well be grave markers. Overbrook will fall, but the mountain will always be haunted. Long live the Overbrook of my many wanderings. Long live her ghosts.